Yeah, Max Ligavere, you just got pretty dang shredded. I mean, you're here in my studio and you're like, are way, way, way leaner than last time I saw you like six months ago. You're down to like 9% body fat. You had a pretty interesting transformation, if I dare say that, from you know, 15, 16% all the way down to this. What were some of your fat loss methods? Let's talk about this. I put a link down below, a special link for ButcherBox. So they have super good grass-fed, grass-finished beef. They have chicken, they have all kinds of seafood options. They even have smoked salmon options now, so you could have that for breakfast. Really cool options, really good price, and it's the best tasting grass-fed meat that you'll probably ever have. And I'm not kidding, it's super good. It gets delivered to your doorstep, and you can choose your cuts, you can change your cuts every month. You can use that link and get free ground beef for life too, which is a special promo that they're running. So really cool stuff, check them out. You don't have to go to the grocery store, it just gets delivered to your doorstep. And I'm telling you, if you don't have a ribeye for breakfast, then you're not living life. Yeah, I mean, so it's fascinating. I just, I began the journey just wanting to look more like you, you know? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I, uh, I'm, not a, I'm not an athlete, I'm not a bodybuilder, but I, I had in the back of my head the methodology and the science of fat loss, like the, fun, the fundamentals, but I wanted the experience. Um, and I knew that I have no, you know, I have no major incentive to do it. I don't like, you know, I don't show myself shirtless on social media all that often. So, but I thought like, if I don't do it now, I'm never gonna do it. So I, I basically, I, adopted a few fundamental principles that made it really easy. Um, and I think the first one was that I was previously eating out quite a bit. Now, I'm, I love restaurants. I think going out to eat with friends is like part of the human experience, right? But one of the, I think, one of the unfortunate truths about eating out is that restaurant food is coated in mysterious fat calories almost inevitably. Right, like I remember being at a restaurant um, fairly recently actually and ordering steamed vegetables and the vegetables came coated in oil, right? So it's like fat is super easily, dietary fat is super easily stored as fat. And if you're eating out on a regular basis, fast food, rest, even higher end restaurants, you're inevitably consuming you know, hundreds of phantom calories on a daily basis. And all you need is five, a, a calorie deficit of 500 calories a day spread out over the course of a week to equate to a pound of fat loss. And so what I started doing was I started eating home more often and just like auditing my food and being a lot more diligent about the added fats. In fact, I cut out most added fats. Um, and, uh, and I saw the fat just melt off, like, you know, in so doing. Um, even with fats that I, that I know are typically quite benevolent, like extra virgin olive oil. We know that extra virgin olive oil, meta-analyses show, have, has a powerful anti-inflammatory effect associated with the Mediterranean diet, which, you know, in tandem with that, has all these other, you know, health benefits, risk-reducing effects for cardiovascular disease and the like. But I even, I even started to limit that. And I started swapping my, you know, my meats. I'm a big advocate for the consumption of, of like, red meat. I started swapping my meats for leaner cuts. I was eating ribeyes really frequently and I started opting for, you know, cheaper but leaner cuts like flank steak, um, I'd throw in the occasional tenderloin, New York strip steak, all leaner. And, and this isn't like, you know, I didn't adopt a low fat diet. I think it's like really important for people to, to know that you still, like fat is great. You still need fat to absorb fat soluble compounds in your food, whether we're talking about vitamins or phytochemicals. You need it for proper digestion, right? You need fat so as to prevent gallstones. You need your omega-3 fatty acids. You need fats to optimize hormones. But you can still cut out a huge amount of excess fat calories while still getting the appropriate amount of fat to support your biology optimally. Totally, man. It's a very important thing to note. I mean, with that, okay, so we've got your uh, cutting out the restaurant food, which dovetailed nicely into reducing the uh, dietary fat. If we focus on that for a little bit, I think that is a low hanging fruit that people really, really get confused about and are easily missing out on. And, and that's such an important piece. Biochemically, fat stores as fat so easily. If you are in a caloric surplus even that much, one gram of fat is going to essentially store immediately. Like mm -hmm. there's, whereas if you overeat carbohydrates, there are a myriad of other issues that happen when you overeat carbohydrates, but carbohydrates have to go through multiple, multiple steps to ultimately go through de novo lipogenesis. Seven steps, uh, you know, enzymatic processes to ultimately get turned into a fat. That in and of itself takes energy. There's an energy demand with that. So it's much easier to store fat. 
but we have to constantly combat this, well, eat fat to burn fat, eat fat to burn fat. Although that makes sense in theory, or on a very low carb ketogenic diet, fats are a quote unquote fuel, you're never eating fat to burn fat. You're either eating fat as an energy source or you're eating fat to store it. And this is exactly the way that I've like pulled the lever to go maybe from, you know, if I need to go from 10% to 7% or something. The biggest lever I can pull is just the restriction or the limitation of these excess dietary fats. I also want to echo just your sentiments on the lean meats. Like if you take a look at, let's take a look uh, at two ribeye steaks. So you buy a ribeye steak from Rayleigh's and I buy a ribeye steak from Kroger. And they're both uh, 12 ounce ribeyes. We put them next to each other. Your ribeye might have 20 grams of fat. Mine might have 40. And looking at it, you might never even know the difference. Exactly. And how many calories is that? Well, nine calories per gram, 20. I mean, do the math. So it's just so much easier to keep somewhat control of your macronutrient intake when you're using leaner meats. It doesn't mean that fatty cuts are meaner and bad. It just means if you're keeping track, opt for the leaner cuts. Yeah, and to tell you the truth, I mean, I went from 15 to 16% body fat down to about 11% body fat without tracking calories. I literally just like started eating home more often and I cut out those, 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 the mysterious like sauces and oils that you get in restaurants and I started being a lot more diligent about the added fats and I did the swap over to leaner meats. I also started um, buying leaner dairy products and without tracking, I mean, the, the, the fat just like, you know, came off. Now, I think that tracking can be extremely valuable and probably even necessary to go below that. Like for me to go from, you know, 10.5% body fat to 9% body fat, I did start tracking a little bit to just audit where my calories were coming from and to make sure that I was getting enough fat and getting enough protein. Because I mean, the last thing you wanna do is lose muscle, right? So I wanted to make sure that I was getting adequate protein. I was aiming for about a gram per pound of, of body weight. But the other thing that I think is like, again, really counterintuitive, especially in our space, like I kept my carbohydrate intake up. And the reason that I did that is that carbs provide the energy for that anaerobic glycolytic exercise. Like we need to keep our energy up in the gym. We need to continue to perform. Like a lot of people when, when they, I think, engage with a cutting phase, they'll think that they're automatically gonna get weaker. But if you don't have that mindset and you keep your carbohydrate intake up, there's really no reason for you to get weaker, you know, like so long as you're storing that glycogen and you, and you use it. Um, uh, you know, keeping my carbs up was like super, super helpful. Also, carbohydrate containing foods like whole fruit are a lot more satiating than fat. So when it comes to like hitting those satiety thresholds, um, you know, I, th I think it's really important for people to realize that like a tablespoon of oil has as many calories as a large honey crisp apple. Yeah. And I'm saying this with a bias because I happen to love honey crisp apples, but what do you think is more satiating, a tablespoon of oil or a honey crisp apple that has minerals and fiber and water and you know, all these great carbohydrates that you can then use in the gym? To, it's to, yeah, such a valid point. And I think, you know, as you get further on your journey and you start to refine things more, then you can start messing with timing and you start playing with carb timing. And me coming from a, a lower carbohydrate space, uh, you know, it was difficult for me to add carbohydrates in mentally. Like, I'm just like, okay, where do I strategically add them in? Um, I, I can't do more than about 200 grams of carbohydrates before I start feeling weird. And that's the thing is like, okay, there's lots of different ways that we can go about skinning this. Uh, so what I learned is that, okay, when are the periods of time that I can have more carbohydrates? So it was, you know, backloading post-workout where I was restoring muscle glycogen. You know, when you talk about energy for the gym, um, you know, a good portion of the energy that's fueling that direct muscle that you're training is coming from the actual glycogen that's in it, not just what's in the bloodstream. So then being able for me, okay, how can I train in a depleted state, as depleted as possible, so I can ensure what I'm pulling from at this particular case is already stored, whether it's glycogen and fat. Well, for me, although the research is really 50-50, so I can't say it's gonna work for everyone, is I like to train in a fasted state and then immediately sort of recoup with appropriate carbohydrates. Uh, and if you do like a lower fat diet, it's almost, I shouldn't even say that. If you decrease your fats, you almost do need to add those carbohydrates back in because then you just like, what are you eating? You're just like eating just lean protein. And that's almost like a protein sparing modified fast, which can be done for short amounts of time. Rabbit starvation. You yeah, know? It's exactly. Like, yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. No, I mean, the thing about um, the yeah carbohydrate intake, it's like, 
I, I've always recommended that this, this, this quote unquote safest time to consume carbohydrates is, is in that backloading context, right? Is post-workout because then you benefit from insulin independent glucose uptake into yeah. muscle, right? So for somebody who's like insulin resistant, who is maybe pre-diabetic or, or even a, a type two diabetic, I mean, that's gonna be a great time to consume whatever carbohydrates you want and to manage your blood sugar accordingly. And you know, lo and behold, you look statistically at the population, like a lot of people do struggle with blood sugar regulation, but you're somebody who appears like, you know, pristinely insulin sensitive. I know that I'm very insulin sensitive. And so for me, I had no issue with doing like pre-workout carbohydrates and then using those carbs, you know, because we know that peri-workout carbohydrates can help support, you know, exercise intensity as well. And also like, I, I go to the gym on a, on a fairly regular basis. So like while glycogen will, you will re-glycogenate yeah. over time. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's like, I wanted to, I'm going, I'm training each muscle group twice a week at this point and I, and I strive to do so intensely. So, um, so yeah, the carbohydrates have been like, you know, super important. So basically how I arranged my macros was I kept my protein intake high. So, you know, 0.7 to one grams per pound of body weight. I started out relatively lean. So I just, I used my body weight. I didn't use like my ideal weight or anything like that. And probably on a daily basis, I'm hitting about one gram, if not more per, per pound of body weight. And then, you know, I, I adjusted my, my fat without really thinking too much about it, just cutting out a lot of the added fats and getting my, you know, the, the bulk of my fats from whole eggs, lean steak and things like that. And then I would fill the rest of my, you know, of like my, my calorie needs with, with carbohydrates. And usually from whole food, fruit, you know, fruit and vegetable, fruits and vegetables, which are self-limiting. And, and yeah, again, it was like, it was a lot easier than I had thought. The one challenge, which, is a challenge. It's it's not a trivial, um, you know, data point. Is that you have to make sacrifices. You have to like. It's a lot harder to like socially go out to restaurants and things like that. So I'd be curious on my show at some point to pick your brain about how you manage to stay so lean with the social obligations and the family life that you have and going out to restaurants and the like. Because I feel like that is the one variable that makes it more difficult. But eating home, I think for for the most part, made it a breeze. Yeah, I think you know to coin something that. Uh, Dr. Daniel Amen said to me earlier this week when I was filming with him, uh, you know, he's a double board certified psychiatrist and it was, I kind of talked to him about this and he was like, the rule number one for protecting your sanity is uh, not believing every silly thought that pops into your head. Mm. And the reason I say that is I would overthink it way too much when I would go out to eat with people and I would overthink what the people would think about me and uh, if they would judge me for being that annoying customer that asks the waiter to do all kinds of crazy things. But the bottom line is that that's what I needed to do. And I would tip the waiter really, really well if I was a big pain in his ass. <laughs> At the end of the day, I felt good with what I was doing because I was asking a lot and I was making sure that he was compensated accordingly for his time. But the point is, is that uh, that's a big piece of that. But we can mm. save that for another day. If we come back to the protein for a second, I developed a kind of a rule for myself that works really well. For every 100 calories I reduce, I add 10 grams of protein. Hmm. Okay, so what that does is that puts me, there's, you know, obviously you've got four calories per gram, so I'm talking a, a net deficit of 60 calories. So in other words, 100 calories I've reduced, but I've now added 40 grams of protein, or 40 grams of cal 40 calories from protein. So it's a net delta of 60. However, since the thermic effect of protein is anywhere from 20 to 35%, I'm really only looking at like a, a delta of maybe 40 calories. Hmm because the research is pretty strong suggesting that even when you're in a pretty significant caloric deficit, as long as protein needs are met, you will maintain muscle and strength. So that's kind of my rule. It's like, okay, I reduce calories. My rule is for every 100 calories, I increase protein 10. And that's lean protein with no other factors added in. So that's a good rule to follow as you start getting more aggressive with it. Yeah. Um, I'm curious what you did as far as uh, like your time between meals? Uh, what was your eating frequency like? Were you eating three square meals? Were you taking long gaps? What were you doing? Yeah, I mean, I've definitely, I've experimented with all of these different variables, um, not just during this cutting phase, but over the past couple of years, I, one of the things that I took up during the pandemic was boxing. And I realized uh, very early on that if I didn't have food in my system during like a boxing bout, like an hour long, intense with a personal trainer boxing workout, I, I was gonna like bonk, you know? and Typically, I enjoy fasted workouts. Like, I think that fasted workouts are great. I'm kind of like riding on the cortisol that I have and like I'm not digesting anything, so I feel really light. But with boxing in particular, it really showed me the value of having some like peri-workout carbs. 
And so these days, um, yeah, I mean, the biggest variable for me is like I, uh, you know, I'm prone to snacking when I'm bored. You know, I think a lot of people are. I think it's a big problem. I'm human just like everybody else. And so when I'm like, I work from home and I spend a lot of time in proximity to my kitchen, like I feel compelled chronically to go, you know, and, and like put something in my mouth. You know, I just feel like it's like a, it's, it's almost like habitual at this point. And, um, and so one of the things that, that I've used to kind of hack that phenomena is I just have a lot more like sparkling waters and like non-caloric things in the house. Cause sometimes like when I think I'm wanting to snack on something, either I'm maybe dehydrated and I just need a little bit more hydration, um, which sometimes your brain misinterprets as like needing food. Because if you think about it, one of, for one of our ancestors, when potable drinking water ceased to be available, the next best place to find hydration would be from food, right? From like fruits, vegetables, and even meat is like a source of hydration. So sometimes when I feel like, you know, if it's like a hunger pang or whatever, you know, it could just be that I'm like dehydrated or it could just be that I'm like bored. And so I'll go and I'll like, you know, mix up uh, like an electrolyte drink or I'll drink like a sparkling water or, you know, make a tea or something or have like an iced coffee, you know. A lot of the times like your brain can play tricks on you, especially when you're in close proximity to foods that you really like otherwise enjoy. And I think like one of the reasons why like food is so amazing is that it's not just fuel, right? Like we celebrate with food and, and it does bring so much joy and pleasure to our lives. And I, th I also think it's really important to just to kind of like also state that like this wasn't for me like about health. Like I was perfectly healthy at 15, 16% body fat. It was just like a personal challenge. I just wanted to see if I could do it and learn from, from the experience. Um, but, uh, but yeah, like if you're, if you're trying to lose body fat, I think being really mindful of like the, the, the propensity to snack, it's such a big problem, you know, like, and especially like nobody is snacking. People tend not to snack on hunger satiating foods, like high protein foods. They tend to snack on foods that are like, you know, hyper palatable, right? Like a, some combination of carbs, fat, sugar, and the like. I try to curtail my, my calorie consumption to about two, three hours before I go to sleep. Again, because like, you know, nothing good tends to be consumed after dinner unless we're talking whole fruit. Like most post-dinner snacks tend to be, again, some combination of like fat and carbs um, and a hyper palatable one at that. So yeah, I try to have like two to three meals a day. And if I'm snacking, I'll reach for something high, you know, like an, a protein snack. I'll drink either a protein shake or, you know, have some like cold cuts or whatever. Um, you know, I'm a huge fan of sliced turkey. You did a, actually post on Instagram recently that I really <laughs> like mustard on turkey and things like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Like, yeah. I mean, people have this like people think that deli meat is like this like evil thing, but there's like a continuum of sliced meats and like, yeah. you know, you could buy like sliced turkey that has no nitrates added. I think it's a great snack. Yeah, but, like Applegate Farms has good stuff, and that's no plug. I mean, I'm just saying they have some options that are literally just like Trader Joe's right down the street has one that's just chicken breast and like rosemary and that's it and yeah. it's just sliced like yeah it's a definitely like we get uh hormeled into thinking that it's all like hormel where it's just like this crazy like uh you know cornstarch modified food starch deli meat weird thing but i mean no cold cuts are cold cuts are epic yeah, they're right. absolutely a staple for me when it comes down to like cutting body fat fast yeah no it's amazing i've i mean I I've learned a ton. And I really do think that the low hanging fruit for most people is gonna be eating home more often. That's actually one of the reasons why I wrote my last book, Genius Kitchen, is because I think like eating, eating home is like a major point of leverage. Like we see that people who eat home more frequently, they have the lower risk for obesity. They have, tend to have better cardiometabolic health. Because when you're cooking at home, you have full control, you know? Um, and then even when you're eating out, you can make substitutions. Like, you know, I tend to, I travel a lot. And so if I'm at a hotel and I want to get breakfast, I always get poached eggs. Cause you can't, you're, nobody's using oil to poach eggs, right? Like if you get a scramble, if you get an omelet, chances are, again, you're getting hundreds, of, potentially hundreds of phantom fat calories, you know, irrespective of the eggs and the yolks and things like that. Like you're getting like just the oil that these chefs use. You know, you can get much leaner cuts of meat, um, out, there's all kinds of different swaps that you can make. But yeah, by and large, the number one like thing for me at, at the beginning where I shed you know, a fair amount, about 10 pounds of body fat, eating home more frequently, 
and being more mindful of like the, the dietary fat calories. Yeah, I think those are solid, solid points that pretty much anyone can adopt. Like, mm. It doesn't take a rocket scientist to uh, sit down and craft a plan that really is like that. Now the science is really sticking to it. Uh, but you know, if you focus on the satiating aspects, the only thing I would add in there is uh, you know, fiber. The, the fiber plays such a huge role in just keeping you satiated throughout the course of the day. And then allowing yourself to have those gaps in between meals so that you can have an opportunity to capitalize on your stored fuel, right? If you're consistently grazing all day, independent of calories, you're potentially making it so that, yeah, you could lose weight, but are you making it so that you're losing the wrong kind of weight? Mm. Thermodynamics still apply, but are you ever tapping into fat as much as you could if you would give yourself a chance to actually have a break in between meals? So, you know, having yourself, you know, two or three kind of distinct meals with limited snacking was probably allowing that and allowing for the retention of lean, bas uh, lean body mass a little bit more too. Yeah. Yeah, no, it was great. I mean, I, I haven't lost any lean mass and I've, I'm just as strong, if not stronger in the gym. I think I actually had a, I, I think I actually did a degree of body recomposition actually, which we know is like more difficult for somebody who's trained. And I've been like working out my whole life, whether or not I look like it, that's a different story, but I've been, I've been training my whole life. And, uh, but yeah, I, I seem to have according with the, according to the, to the in body, which I know is not gold standard. I know it's not DEXA, but according to that, and I've been using it at consistent times, um, I did, it does seem that I've been able to put on some muscle while also losing body no, fat. Entire, entirely possible as, pro, as long as protein is where it is. There and it's, uh, that's, that's the name of the game. So, so as always, Max, where can everyone find you, man? Yeah, so I have a podcast called The Genius Life. And uh, I have my own YouTube channel, youtube.com slash Max Lugavere. I'm very active on Instagram, at Max Lugavere. So yeah, people can come check me out on all those channels. Right on. Thanks, man. Thanks, man. Yeah, you're the man. Nice.